Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to wrap up all of the books that I read in November, so let's jump right in. The very first book that I read in the month of November was The Dilemma by B.A. Paris. For my TBR game, this was actually selected as a punishment prompt because I had to read the lowest rated book on my TBR, which this was at the time. So this is following two perspectives. It is a married couple. It is Livia and Adam, and it is the day of Livia's 40th birthday, and she has spent the past two decades planning this amazing birthday bash. And you find out throughout the story why this birthday is so important to her and why she spent so long planning it. But basically, this day is a huge deal, and this book takes place over the entirety of that day and you're seeing from both Adam and Livia's perspective. The only kind of potential hitch in the day is the fact that their daughter Marnie is not going to attend. Marnie is abroad in Hong Kong studying and she wasn't able to make it back. And while it's disappointing, Livia is actually kind of glad because she has recently uncovered a pretty shocking secret about her daughter. It is something that she has not yet told her husband. She is waiting for the right time. She kind of wants them to get through the party so that she could break the news to Adam before Marnie returns home from studying abroad. But what she doesn't know is that Adam has actually secretly arranged to have Marnie fly in to surprise Livia for the party. But just before Adam is about to pick up Marnie from the airport, he gets some terrible news that's going to change everything. And he has to decide whether he's going to tell Livia or let her get through the party before he kind of shatters their whole world. So again, you're following both of these perspectives on the day of the party as they're both dealing with their own secrets, trying to determine when it would be best to reveal them, trying to understand what the repercussions of them are going to be, and you're just following them throughout this day. I don't remember the exact rating of this book. I think it was like a 3.52 or something, which is a fairly low Goodreads rating. So I was very trepidatious going into this book, but I actually enjoyed this quite a lot. And when I was reading the comments, one of the main complaints that I heard was that this is not a typical suspense thriller that you might normally expect from B.A. Paris. Like if you've read other things by her, you might expect this to be very different. And I completely agree with that, but it actually worked for me. So this book is not your typical suspense. The suspense comes from being tense. So you know, like when you are playing with a Jack in the Box and you just know that eventually that toy is going to pop out, you know it's coming, but every single time it does come, it still scares the living daylights out of you. That tension is what you feel in this book. You know that something is coming. You know that eventually all of these secrets are going to be released and you're just waiting for that explosion. You're waiting for Livia to find out what Adam's hiding. You're waiting for Adam to find out what Livia is hiding. So basically you're waiting for them to catch up with you as the reader because you as the reader know exactly what is going on throughout the entirety of the book. So this is more about you being tense than being on the edge of your seat in suspense. I do believe that there is suspense in that being tense, but it is definitely not your standard suspense thriller. And so if you're going into that with proper expectations, I feel like you can get a lot of enjoyment out of this. At its core, I would say it is a family drama and I enjoyed it. I thought that it was well done overall. And if you like those kind of stories, I think that you're really going to enjoy this. But if you're just going into this thinking that it's going to keep you on the edge of your seat as a thriller, you're going to be sadly disappointed. And I think that's why this had such a low rating. But thankfully, I really enjoyed my reading experience and I gave this a four stars. Next, I read Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. And I believe this satisfied the prompt to read a a book club pick because this was the November selection for the Goodreads group that I am a part of. This follows our main character, Tova Sullivan, and I believe in this story she is in her 70s and she's actually experienced her fair share of tragedy. 30 years prior, when her son was just 18, he mysteriously disappeared off of a boat in the Puget Sound. The police think that he committed suicide. Tova knows that he would never do that, that that's not the case, but she was never able to prove it and she never really found out what happened to her son and she's kind of had to live with that grief for the past 30 years. And then her longtime husband of, you know, 50 plus years has recently passed away of cancer. So Tova is really now on her own. And in order to kind of fill her nights, she actually works overnight at the local aquarium doing janitorial work. And so it's during her time at the aquarium that she's developing this kind of friendship with Marcellus, who is a giant Pacific octopus. And you actually get Marcellus's perspective in here. And so you're following Tova as she's living her life, Tova as she's cleaning the aquarium and bonding with Marcellus. And then you're following another perspective in here. His name is Cam. And I don't really want to discuss too much about his perspective because I I feel like it really is about the journey with this book to find out why Cam matters, why his perspective is even in this book, and how he ultimately connects to Tova. This was such a touching and heartwarming and charming story. It is exactly what you would think it would be going into this. My only real complaint overall about this whole book is the fact that we don't get more of Marcellus's perspective. He was absolutely fantastic. I loved reading from his point of view. The audiobook narrator who voiced Marcellus was 
fantastic. I think he did a wonderful job. And I was expecting more Marcellus. I was expecting more of Tova and Marcellus's relationship because that's really all you get on the dust jacket. Like it doesn't even mention the other perspective that you get in the story. As you're reading it and you're uncovering everything, you understand why this other perspective is there because Cam really is the other main character. It really is Tova and Cam and Marcellus is just a side character, which I was not expecting and I wasn't prepared for that. So that's really my only criticism just because I loved Marcellus so much and I was expecting so much more of a relationship building between Marcellus and Tova and I don't feel like you got that. You got Tova a lot of the time outside of the aquarium, Cam outside of the aquarium, and then how they end up connecting in their lives. And like I said, Marcellus was just fantastic. He's probably one of my new favorite literary characters of all time. He was just great, even though we don't get as much of him as I would have liked. But I highly recommend if this sounds interesting to you at all, I'm definitely going to keep my eye on Shelby Van Pelt in the future. Next, I read Goodnight Beautiful by Amy Malloy. This satisfied the prompt to read a book with yellow on the cover. And to be honest with you, I didn't really enjoy this one all that much. It was incredibly forgetful, and I really don't remember Remember almost anything. In fact, when I was looking back to see what I had read in the month, I had completely forgotten that I'd read this. That is how unremarkable this book was. Additionally, I don't really want to say too much about it because I feel like anything I say will be a spoiler. And here's why. The synopsis in the dust jacket is intentionally misleading. It makes you think that this is going to be about one thing and about specific people. And it kind of goes in a different direction that I didn't necessarily appreciate. So let me actually go ahead and just read the dust jacket to you so you can kind of get an idea of my my expectations when I went into the story. Newlywed Sam Statler and Annie Potter are head over heels and excited to say goodbye to New York and start a life together in Sam's sleepy hometown upstate. Or it turns out a life where Annie spends most of her time alone while Sam, her therapist husband, works long hours in his office tending to the egos of his mostly female clientele. Little does Sam know that through a vent in the ceiling, every word of his sessions can be heard from the room upstairs. The pharmacist's wife contemplating a divorce, the well-known painter whose boyfriend doesn't satisfy her in bed, who could resist eavesdropping? Everything is fine until a French girl in the green Mini Cooper shows up and Sam disappears into thin air, throwing a wrench into Sam and Annie's happily ever after. So Sam goes missing, Annie is desperate to find him, and it really goes from there. And like I said, it's not just that, but that is part of the twist. So I can't really say anything more about it and I'm not going to, but that twist didn't really work for me. Overall, this was very lackluster, very mediocre. I don't really remember almost anything about this, and this will definitely be getting sold on Pango now that I've done reading it, I don't need to keep it on my shelves. The next handful of books I'm actually not really going to talk about because I did a whole vlog where I read the lowest rated books on my TBR. So I go much more in depth about what these books are about and my feelings on them in that vlog. So that was kind of a little wrap up in itself. So I'm just going to go ahead and mention the books that I read as part of that vlog. And if you are interested in knowing more of my thoughts, I will be sure to link it down below or up in the cards for you. The first was The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. I actually really enjoyed this one and ended up giving it four stars. Pretty Little Wife by Darby Kane. This was another surprise to me. I had no idea why it was so lowly rated because I really loved her debut book, Pretty Little Wife. And even after reading this, I still don't understand why it was so lowly rated. I flew through this one. This one was like candy. It was a fantastic reading experience for me. And again, I gave this four stars. After The Replacement Wife, I believe I started Fool Me Once by Ashley Winstead, which I did DNF. I DNF'd it after only 12%, which was very early on into the book. And normally I would not consider that a DNF. I would consider it like a trial of the book. But since vlog was specifically for reading the lowest rated books on my TBR, that book was one of them and I wasn't going to be able to complete it or finish it. I did need to officially consider it a DNF. I DNF'd it because it was going to focus heavily on one political side and I don't like that divisiveness. I really didn't like the rhetoric that Ashley Winstead was putting into the book in terms of how one side is way better than the other. One is the good side, one is the dark side. When that is not the case, it is misleading, it is misguided. It just adds to the divisiveness that we experience in our country already. I didn't like it at all and so I don't think that I'm going to be continuing with Ashley Winstead as a contemporary author but I really enjoyed In My Dreams I Hold a Knife and I'm really looking forward to The Last Housewife which I've heard literally nothing nothing but fantastic things about that book. But if her contemporaries are all kind of like that, I can just go ahead and skip them. Then I read Find Me by Elifair Burke, another one of the lowest rated books on my TBR, obviously. And this was another pleasant reading experience for me. I believe I also gave this one four stars. A lot of the books that I read, I really didn't understand why they were so lowly rated. This was another really fast paced kind of popcorn thriller that you don't want to put down. It kept the pages turning. I was enjoying myself the entirety of the time. I liked the little twist that was thrown in at the end for good measure, even though you could 
probably see it coming, but it definitely cemented my plans to continue with Alifair Burke in the future. So again, another solid one. The final book that I read for that vlog was The Last to Vanish by Megan Miranda. This was another one that I enjoyed for the most part overall. I have a love-hate relationship with Megan Miranda. I continue to read her books even though none of them blow me out of the water. But surprisingly, The Last to Vanish was one of the stronger books that I read by her, thankfully. Was I surprised to see her as one of the lowest rated books on my TBR? No. Was I surprised that I actually enjoyed myself more than I thought I would? Yes. I ended up giving that one a 3.5 stars. Then while I was listening to all of those other books on audio, I was actually reading something physically and I finished The Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. This is a beautiful illustrated edition. I was buddy reading this with Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand and we had a great time buddy reading this. I was experiencing it for the first time and this was a reread for her, but she didn't actually remember a whole lot of the details. So it was like she was experiencing it for the first time. And I'm glad that I had somebody to discuss my thoughts with. This is a very beloved series here in the online bookish community. I know Becca from Becca and the Books loves it. Cody from Cody's Book Corner loves it. And I was a little bit hesitant because I'm still fairly new to adult fantasy and I feel like this is kind of a classic adult fantasy at this point. But luckily I enjoyed my overall reading experience, especially towards the end. If you're not familiar, this follows our main character, Fix. And when he is just six years old, his maternal grandfather takes him and basically drops him at the door of the royal keep. He says, this is the bastard son of Prince Chivalry. I'm tired of taking care of him and it's up to you guys to now take care of him. Prince Chivalry, who is the king in waiting, he is next in line to the throne. Chivalry basically abdicates his right to the throne and he takes off with his wife. He really doesn't want anything to do with Fitz and so he just takes off. And so Fitz is kind of left in the care of Burrich who kind of takes care of the hounds and the horses and things of that nature. People are not necessarily very kind to Fitz. They always refer to him as the bastard. He doesn't really fit. He has no place. He doesn't really have a lot of friends. And then a couple of years later, the actual king, so his grandfather says, I'm going to have you trained as an assassin because I want you to be useful to this royal family and I want you to be loyal to this royal royal family. And so you see him start going through the trainings that he's going to need to be an assassin. You also see him trained in a few other different areas as well. For the most part, a lot of this book was very slow. It was a lot of buildup. Not a whole heck of a lot happened throughout the entirety of the book up until you're getting to the last few chapters when it really picks up. So I feel like a lot of this was just context leading into what you're going to get into later on, which was fine because even though it was slow, I enjoyed trying to get absorbed in the world and learning about the characters. I actually read this physically while listening to it, which I felt was a great way to go because I don't know if I would have been able to concentrate on it just reading it physically. So the audiobook near reader wasn't terrible at all. I would say my only real complaint about this is you don't actually see a lot of the training that Fitz goes through to be an assassin and you don't even really see his first kills as an assassin. All of a sudden he is trained and he's killing people and he's sent on a big mission to kill somebody. And I was like, okay, uh, I guess Fitz is now an assassin. And it's even harder to believe because when this book starts, he is six. And by the time it ends, I think he's only like 15 years old. So he's still a very young person. And since you're following him from the time he's six, it's really hard to picture him as an assassin, if that makes sense. So by the time we were getting to the final chapters where it's definitely more fast paced, there's a lot more at stake. It was hard for me to wrap my mind about the fact that he was being sent on such a big mission to kill an important person. But overall, I really liked the writing style of this. Robin Hobb has a great tone to her writing. It felt really medieval, which without being hard to understand, like it wasn't Shakespeare-esque, no, but it very much fit the vibe of the book. So overall, I had a very positive reading experience with this, and I believe Sarah and I might continue with it in January. That's not set in stone at this point, but I think we are definitely going to continue and try to keep the momentum going with this series. I gave this one a four stars, and I believe this satisfied the prompt to start a series. Next, I ended up picking up a book called Unspeakable Things by Jess Lurie. Jess Lurie is a new to me author. I had never heard of her before, and she came on my radar because of a recent book that I had heard of called The Quarry Girls, which I did pick up. And in the meantime, I decided to start another one of her books. This book is supposedly based on crimes that actually happened in Minnesota where young boys are being sexually assaulted and then let go. And the entirety of the story is told through Cassie McDonald, who is only actually 12 at the time, which was difficult for me to get behind. I don't necessarily love reading from young narrators. So right there, that kind of tripped me up. But I also find that this book is a little bit hard to pinpoint in terms of what it was actually about and what the purpose of it actually was. So the majority of the book, you're following Cassie as she's living her daily life. And one of the biggest pieces of that is her kind of dysfunctional family. Her father is a Vietnam veteran. He's got, definitely got PTSD. He seems to be a somewhat volatile man. He definitely drinks more than he should. Cassie seems to be very afraid of him. She actually on page tries to get her mother to leave him. So it sounds like there's some kinky things going on in that family, especially because fairly frequently they kind of hold sex parties and Cassie and her sister are there to kind of witness 
everything happening. So this family is not necessarily on the up and up. And it's really following from Cassie's perspective, her life and her dealing with her family. But when I was reading the synopsis of this book, I was made to believe that it was going to be more of a focus on these crimes. So you hear about these crimes secondhand because Cassie is basically hearing about them secondhand. She's overhearing people talk about them and they only affect her just because she kind of knows the boys that are being attacked. But that's really it. You're not really following a lot of investigation about the crimes or hearing a lot about the details of the crimes. You're just hearing that boys are being sexually assaulted. They're being let go. And then of course they're kind of traumatized and changed after that. And because Cassie knows these boys, she's able to talk to some of them and things of that nature. But that's really it. There wasn't really a focus on that at all. But instead the focus was really on Cassie and her family and her fear of her dad, which is another thing that I kind of found unusual because you don't actually see on paper her dad doing much of anything. You find out towards the end exactly why she's scared and why she behaves the way that she does. But like you as the reader don't really get to see any of that. So I was like, okay, Cassie, why are you scared? I understand that this guy has a temper and he possibly gets physical, but there was more to it than that. You as the reader kind of understand why she's probably scared, but you don't, you don't see any of that. And so I was trying to understand how all of these pieces fit together and why this book was advertised as kind of being a true crime based story, but it really isn't. I didn't feel like this book was very cohesive overall. It wasn't really what I wanted. And again, I have a hard time reading from a young narrator. So this didn't really work for me and I gave it a three stars. Next, I read Indelible by Karen Slaughter. This is the fourth book in her Grant County series. This series is set in Grant County, Georgia, a very small county. Sarah Linton is one of the main characters. She is the town's pediatrician. She's also the town's medical examiner. And this book follows her as she is working cases with Jeffrey Tolliver, who is the chief of police and also Sarah's ex-husband. And in this series, you're following them as they are working on these crimes together. In book four, you're actually following as somebody comes into the police station and starts shooting it up and starts taking hostages. And so that is what's happening in the present day. And then in the past, you are following Sarah and Jeffrey as they are just kind of starting to date and get serious in their relationship, which I thought was an interesting touch because up until that point, we hadn't really seen much of that before. So I really enjoyed that aspect over it. Overall, I'm finding that this series gets stronger and stronger as it goes along. I definitely plan to finish. I believe there are two more books in this series and then she also has her Will Trent series but I wanted to go ahead and finish Grant County because I believe Will Trent is first introduced in one of those books or at least there's a crossover at some point and then I will definitely get into Will Trent later on. So this was another solid four stars for me. Really quickly I should also mention that by the time I had finished Assassin's Apprentice that was the very last book that I planned to read for my November TBR. There were two other books on my TBR. Amy and Roger's Epic Detour which was going to satisfy another punishment prompt to read a potential unhaul book. And then there was also The Shadows by Alex North, which I believe satisfied the prompt to read a book box pick. I decided that I really wasn't interested in either one of those books. And so I am going to go ahead and unhaul those two. I'm not even going to worry about it. I'm not even going to try to attempt to read them in December. Those are just going to go away and be unhauled. So I just wanted to mention that briefly because I didn't actually read all the books that were on my November TBR as I am unhauling them. Then I read The Sound of Rain by Greg Olson. This is the very first book in his Detective Nicole Foster series. At the very start of the story, Nicole Foster is basically a disgraced former detective. She is very much down on her luck. She has a gambling problem. She has lost her home. She's basically lost her car, her dog. She really doesn't have anything left to her name. She's really just struggling to survive. Her sister is not a whole lot of help. She's kind of in and out of women's shelters. And then one day you find her connecting with this gentleman who was actually part of the case that ended up ruining her career. I think it was like a year prior to the start of the story, there was a case of a little girl who went missing and was later found dead. And this man was that little girl's father. And somebody was arrested for the crime. That person later ended up killing themselves because they were arrested. But it was later revealed that Nicole's partner, both romantically and professionally, kind of did some shady things to get him arrested and to keep him locked up when there was a possibility that he might not have actually been guilty. So that was brought to light. Her partner ended up going to jail and he ended up kind of taking Nicole down with him. So Nicole was once a highly respected detective and now she has just basically hit rock bottom. And when she runs into the father of this girl, he is basically desperate. He wants to find out what happened to his little girl. And Nicole wants to find out as well because her whole life was basically ruined by this case. And she believes an innocent man might have ended up dead because of everything that happened. And so you're following her as she's investigating, trying to find out what actually happened to that dead little girl. Overall, I thought that this was okay. I liked Greg Olson's writing style. And I found that when I was listening to it, I was pretty actively engaged in the story, but I was never emotionally connected to 
it. And so when I wasn't reading it, I wasn't even thinking about it and I wasn't like excited to pick it up. So there was somewhat of a disconnect there, but overall I liked the story. The story itself was strong. I thought there were some pretty good twists in there. It ended really abruptly though. It was almost as if Greg Olson had a much longer book planned and that's when they decided you know what we're gonna split this into at least two books because I know there's at least one more book in this series and they just picked a point to end the book. I, I really don't think that's what happened. I think he intentionally chose to end it there but it didn't feel like a natural stopping point. Like I said it felt very just abrupt like there definitely should have been a few more pages or possibly an epilogue. It just didn't feel like that should have been where it stopped. There felt like there was a lot of things that were unresolved they could possibly be resolved in book two. That's possibly what's going to happen. But still, I feel like there was a better way to end the story. So overall, this was okay. I think I gave it like a 3.5 stars. I probably will be continuing in that series. It wasn't mind blowing or anything of that nature, but I am interested in Greg Olson as an author. I do have a true crime book that he wrote and I'm wanting to see what he does with true crime. And so I want to kind of proceed with him and see how this series progresses. And then of course that true crime book. So we're going to give him another shot in the future. And the final book that I read for the month of November was A Bridge Across the Ocean by Susan Meisner. This is a historical fiction novel that I very much enjoy. And this one was actually set on the Queen Mary. So if you're not familiar, the Queen Mary was once a luxury cruise liner. It operated, I believe, in the 1930s through the 1960s. It also operated as a troop transport during World War II, and it also transported war brides from Europe, United Kingdom to America after the war was over. And so you're following three perspectives. In the present day, you're following Brett, and Brett actually has the ability to see ghosts. She can see spirits who are kind of caught in the in-between, who have not crossed over. And this gift is basically something that she's ignored her entire life. She's definitely no ghost whisperer. She doesn't try to engage with them. She doesn't try to interact or help them in any way. This ignoring her gift has actually kind of caused problems in other areas of her life, and she's kind of starting to feel the ramifications of that. And when an old high school friend that knows what she can do asks for her help, she reluctantly agrees. This friend says that his young six-year-old daughter was on the Queen Mary and sensed or felt the ghost of her dead mother. And now she's absolutely refusing to leave the area. They live in Texas and they were in California where the Queen Mary is now permanently docked. It is a hotel and museum type of situation. And so they were there visiting and now his daughter doesn't want to leave and he's begging Brett. He's like, can you please go on to the Queen Mary and see if you can see her mother so that we can try to get her to, to move on from this. And Brett goes and she's on the Queen Mary and she doesn't sense the girl's mother, but she does sense another spirit. And this spirit kind of brings her attention to a decades old mystery that nobody knows as a mystery. It brings her attention to this girl who apparently was on the crossing in 1946 from London to America as a war bride to meet up with her husband. But there was a scandal involving her and apparently she committed suicide. But the spirit on board the boat says that's not the case. And suddenly Brett feels the need to solve this mystery. She feels like this is big and she needs to solve it and that solving this will also help her in some of the personal problems that she is experiencing. So in the present day, you're following her as she's trying to unravel this mystery. Then in the 1940s, during World War II, you're following two different perspectives. The first is Simone Devereaux and at the very start of the story, she is hiding out in a wine cellar because she is wanted by the Gestapo because she has killed one of them. She watched them murder her brother and father who were resistance members in front of her eyes and when one of them came after her, she did what she had to do. And so now she's just kind of waiting until it's safe for her to leave. And you're following her journey during that time up until she eventually boards the Queen Mary in 1946. You're also following the perspective of Annalisa, who was a ballerina and she was kind of forced to marry a Nazi. And this Nazi was not nice to her. He did horrific things to her and she was desperate to escape. So she kind of ran away. And so you're following her as she's marrying this guy, what happens during the marriage and then as she runs away and what happens after the marriage and the things that happen to lead her to the Queen Mary as well. And then eventually Simone's and Annalisa's perspective merge as they are on the Queen Mary in 1946, headed to the United States. And you're following like what happened during the time on the ship, the secrets that were revealed, what the actual mystery was, what happened and things of that nature. I enjoyed this one a lot more than I was expecting to. It really impressed me. I loved all of the perspectives. I really enjoyed how Susan Meisner wove all of the perspectives, how they all connected and the resolution to it as well. So overall, I felt that this was a very strong historical fiction. Susan Meisner is definitely quickly becoming one of my favorite historical fiction authors, and I'm excited to read more from her in the future. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I read in the month of November. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books and what your thoughts were. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys.